capable of doing things in that camp to people that the Nazis wanted done, they know they find their men in Ica. And so they bring him out of the facility in which he was institutionalized, put his uniform back on, and they set him loose in this place. <laughs> Ica and his followers will come to be known as the Totenkamp, Death's Head. He will institute unimaginable tortures and punishments in this place. As a matter of fact, he's going to turn Dachau into an SS training ground because they have all these prisoners, these inmates, whom they could pull out at will and torture as part of their training. Um, because of ICA's policies in Dachau, the other death camps also will become SS training grounds in the future. Dachau is the model for all future concentration camps. <clears throat> I also want to talk now at this point about a night in history we know as Kristallnacht. Many of my students know about that. Um, the Night of the Broken Glass in November 1938. Kristallnacht shouldn't have been a great surprise to anybody. Many people, especially Jews in Germany, saw it coming. <coughs> For years before Kristallnacht, Jews like these in these photographs were harassed and tortured by Nazis on the streets. Nobody step forth to help them. And then in 1933, there were the book, born, book burnings in which uh, Goebbels and others led this um, weird uh, evening of destroying 20,000 volumes of books and musical works uh, composed by Jewish uh, musicians and, and authors. Uh, in the name of cleansing Germany of uh, those who weren't, who weren't pure. Cleansing Germany of uh, an inferior race. It starts here. <laughs> they should have seen it coming. Many did. Many Jews who could afford it left the country. Tens of thousands of them. But most were not able to get out of time. Here you have more of this harassment. You have Jews here being forced to clean the street with brushes and, uh, and toothbrushes. The Nazis label many Jewish businesses and harass anyone who's trying to go in to do shopping there. Another systematic effort to destroy their commerce, Jewish commerce. <coughs> As part of Crystal Knot, November 9, 1938, mobs destroy. 815 Jewish shops. They destroyed 171 homes owned by Jews. They burned, as you see here, 119 synagogues. 90 Jews were murdered. And I want to add this. When the survivors um, submitted the claims for damages to their insurance companies, the Nazi government stepped in and seized the claims. That night, 33,000 Jews were arrested. 11,000 of them were sent to Dachau. The rest went to Buchenwald and Sachsenhausen. The inmates at this point in Dachau will include Jews now, Gypsies, independent thinkers, that's what the Nazis called those who opposed their um, way of thinking. Communists, intellectuals, homosexuals, the physically and mentally handicapped as well. Yes, it's at this time that the program called eugenics is launched by the Nazis. Eugenics meant getting rid of the undesirables. Between 1934 and 1940, the Nazis sterilized 400,000 Germans deemed mentally or even physically unfit to have children. To do this, a committee of doctors screened patients in the name of racial hygiene. Racial hygiene. 
Those are terms introduced by the Nazis. 3,000 of these poor folks ended up in Dachau, and from there they were sent to Hardheim Castle in nearby Austria, where they were done away with in the most cruelest of ways. Dachau will grow to about 123 subcamps throughout Bavaria. In other words, they are branches of Dachau, smaller in area, but just as lethal. And in these camps, people were put to work in uh, munitions factories, mostly, for the German war effort. Here you have inmates of the Dachau camp facility um, building uh, rifles. You'll have, um, I, I talked to one survivor who's gone now, I would have brought him here today, who, um, whose job was in a, in a Messerschmitt factory, um, putting the wheels on Messerschmitt airplanes. And by the way, a lot of these weapons were sabotaged. Uh, the person I spoke to, Bill Gross, uh, intentionally loosened the bolts on all the struts that he ever had any contact with, which means in time, the wheel would fall off and the plane landed and save him off. Hopefully ruining that pilot's day. Um, but these subcamps were all over southern Germany. Some of them very close to Munich and Dachau. Some of them uh, a few miles further away. In all of these facilities, the prisoners were given meager rations so that gradually they weakened and perished. They either died from malnutrition or they were shot and tortured. So people all over the area would often see these work crews um, impressed into, into, into labor. That's why I find it so difficult when I read that uh, many citizens in Dachau, in the town of Dachau, claimed they didn't know what was going on. And of course, a lot of these people, once they passed away, ended up in the crematoria there at Dachau. Between the fall of 1941 and March of 1942, over 6,000 Soviet POWs were brought in and shot at Dachau. Most of them were executed outside of the town. I'm sorry, outside of the camp. So people in the town had to hear all of this. Many of them were shot along what came to be known as the death wall inside the camp. Notice the ditch in front of that wall. The, the Nazis called it the blood ditch. It drained everything. In March 1942, the Nazis decided they needed to build a larger crematoria at Dachau. The facility they had uh, wasn't large enough to accommodate the work they were doing. This is all part of the final solution mandated by the Nazi party for the larger and larger number of prisoners who were coming into Dachau and the other facilities. And so Barracks 10, this is Barracks 10 today, was to have uh, four sets of ovens as well as a gas chamber. This place was built just outside the northwest corner of the camp, a couple hundred feet away from the original uh, crematoria, which still stands as well. <coughs> it's never proven that the gas chamber uh, was used. As a matter of fact, um, from what I've read, the gas chamber itself in Barracks 10 was never used. The ovens were, but not the uh, not the um, the gas chamber itself, and that's possibly because of sabotage. This whole facility was built with uh, labor, with the labor of Catholic priests who were brought in from Poland. The Nazis made them build this place. And it's believed that the priests intentionally put too much sand into the mix so that the mortar was making the brick kept falling out. And therefore, the, uh, 
the, 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 the uh, um, gas chamber itself couldn't be used. We know that the crematorium was used. This is a photograph taken from the time. Dachau, you see here in the aerial view, was built to house 5,000 prisoners. By the end of the war, there were always more than 30,000 people packed into this place on a daily basis. There were 32 barracks here. These are the foundations that you see today if you ever visited this place. One of the barracks was set aside for the diabolical human experiments that took place here. I will touch on that shortly. Another barracks was reserved only for priests. It was called the priests' barracks. And then there was barracks 15 which was set aside for the most vicious punishments. The open area in front of the main office building by the main gate was a site of frequent terror. Here, prisoners were tortured, there were hangings, there were shootings, there were even drownings in front of the general inmate population. This is Egon Zill. He will take Ica's place. Ica will go on to uh, take command of an SS division on the Eastern Front in the Soviet Union. Egon Zill, who is just as bad as Ica, takes his place as the commandant. Zill introduces even newer methods of torture. He enjoyed watching police dogs maim the inmates. Uh, here you have inmates who have to stand in attention. There's, there's food in front of them. You can't see the food table. If they flinch, the dogs are trained to maul them. Here you have a fellow in the drawing, drawn by a survivor after the war, of uh, a, a poor inmate who's, who's lashed to a pole with a dog directly in front of him. The moment he flinches, that dog's going to maul him. Zill enjoyed watching this sort of thing. He also is going to introduce pole hanging. It's like a sport to these guys. Their hands, the inmates have their hands tied behind them and they're raised up on a pole or uh, on a beam like this inside one of the barracks. He brings forth the whipping table. Now, this is a guard, these are a couple of guards who demonstrated to President Eisenhower and other generals after Jacka was liberated how this uh, whipping table was used. The guards would stretch an inmate over that table and they would beat him unmercifully with whips and, and uh, clubs, breaking his bones and so forth. Uh, that whipping table is there in the museum in Dachau today, complete with one of the whips that was used. When the guards see how um, Egon Zill treats these people, how barbaric he is, they follow suit. This is Shoney Alex Braun. Perhaps if I have any uh, uh, music majors in here, you've heard his name. Braun was a violin player in a barracks that housed other musicians. One day, he was called outside by an SS guard to play a composition. When he steps out of the, uh, the barracks, he sees here on the ground the bodies of two of his colleagues who had been brained by a capo who was standing over them. A capo was a camp guard who was also an inmate. And these capos are brutal, brutal people. They um, often served almost as a servant to a regular SS guard in the camp. And um, they did whatever that person wanted them to do. Uh, probably because it meant they'd stay alive longer if they followed the direction of the person who was in control of them. And so Braun is ordered to play classical music with his violin as the capo stood next to him. Braun responds by playing Blue Danube. The capo kept eagerly asking his SS master all along, when 
shall I whack him? When shall I hit him? He couldn't wait to beat Braun over the head with a club. Meanwhile, the SS guard sort of danced there in place and gazed out into the sky, beating the rhythm with his fingers on his hand. His other hand, like one, two, three, one, two, three. And, and he just smiled and finally told the capo, ah, let him live. That's how, that's how cheap life was to these, these Nazis. Can you imagine that? They had such complete power to make a decision there at the moment, on the spot, life and death over anybody who was there. Ah, let them live. There's also Theodora Haas, a survivor who wrote afterwards, if you had treated an animal in Germany the way we were treated, you would have been jailed. For example, a guard or a group of them would single out a prisoner and beat him with canes or a club. Sometimes to further terrorize a prisoner, the guards would form a circle around a prisoner and beat him unconscious. There were cases of a prisoner being told to report to the hospital. They had a little facility there in the camp and being forced to drink a quart of castor oil. Believe me, this is a lousy, painful, wretched way to die. You develop extreme diarrhea, vomiting, nausea, and severe dehydration. If the Nazis wanted you to live and suffer more, they would take measures to rehydrate the victim. And then they'd start all over again. And then there were the dialogue, the diabolical experiments I had uh, mentioned earlier. Here, in this photo, you see a prisoner who was immersed in freezing water for hours. Different methods were used to revive these people as quickly as possible. These experiments were meant to benefit Luftwaffe pilots who might be shot down over cold water. 300 prisoners were handpicked for this experiment. A third of them perished. The two doctors in charge of this experiment, Dr. Ernst Holzner and Dr. Eric Finka. There was also Dr. Sigmund Rascher, who conducted high altitude experiments. His victims were strapped in decompression chambers. This experiment was meant to aid German pilots who might parachute out of their planes at high altitudes. The, uh, the decompression chamber simulated conditions of up to 60,000 feet. Of the 200 subjects who were chosen for this experiment, 80 died from the experiment. The rest were executed. Those who died during the experiment had their brains dissected to see what the effect of the experiment was. And then there was Dr. Claus Schilling there at Dachau, who infected 1,100 inmates with malaria. He was searching for a medical cure to tropical diseases. His victims were also infected with typhus, as well as tuberculosis, in an effort to discover antibiotics. He also uh, conducted experiments on human beings to see how they could make seawater drinkable. All these experiments were conducted without anesthesia. There were others that I won't even get into. As the Allied armies advanced into Germany, larger and larger numbers of inmates were sent to Dachau from other regions of Germany that were being invaded by the Soviets or by uh, the uh, British and Americans. By early 1945, 1,600 prisoners, 1,600 prisoners were packed into a barracks built for 200. These prisoners are standing on what they called the spirit of the camp road. Notice the poplar trees in the background. A couple hours every evening, they were allowed to mill about and gather under uh, the, uh, the muzzles of Nazi guns, where they often talked or uh, communicated and so forth. This is, this is the road as it looks today. You walk down that road, you just 
You can only imagine the misery that these people were experiencing. On the 14th of April, Himmler ordered, quote, no prisoner should be allowed to fall into the hands of the enemy alive. And so they began a mass evacuation of Dachau. This is a photograph of Dachau inmates uh, marching to locations further south. Thousands perish on these journeys. They die from exposure. Um, they, they're so weak, many of them can't walk. The, the guards just shoot them. Again, a photograph taken by a resident showing these people marching through Dachau. And then the executions in Dachau and through the, in the sub camps were ramped up as well. They, they couldn't get the people out of the camps quickly enough. The Allies are invading Germany. Um, this is the sub camp not far away from Dachau, Herlock. Everyone was, nearly everyone was, was, was gone here. As the American 42nd and 45th Infantry Divisions closed in on Munich, they came upon the concentration camp of Dachau. Now, as I talk about this, I want you to know that there's a lot of confusion. Read different books as I have about this, uh, about the liberation of the camp, and, and you'll never be able to get the real story. There was so much going on so quickly, it's chaos. I do know this, our, our troops had to fight their way to Dachau. Their mission was to take Munich, and then they find this place. At the same time, I wanna, uh, I wanna state, Easy Company, the 101st Airborne Division, um, was not on the grounds here. They liberated the sub-camp of Buklo, several miles away. It was part of the Dachau system. But it all, you know, even though Dachau is bigger, these sub camps were the same. They were horrific. This is the death train, as the Americans called it, in the woods near the, the rear of the camp. This train consisted of 39 cars that came from Birkenau. The train was loaded with Hungarian and Polish Jews who had undertaken a forced journey of 30 to 40 days. When the Americans found this train, there were 2,310 bodies on it. Some of the people in weakened conditions had tried to roll out of the cars when the train stopped and the Nazi guard shot them right there along the tracks. Most of the others if they were still alive, were shot inside the cars. <coughs> Most of them, however, had already starved to death or suffocated. There were bodies here stacked in the, in the cars waiting for cremation, but they hadn't been cremated yet. The train's been here for a day or two. They hadn't been cremated yet because the Nazis ran out of coal. They couldn't run the, the furnaces. Private John Lee of the 45th Division, the Thunderbirds, said this about his uh, discovery of the cars. These people were stuck in these cars. The cars had bullet holes all over them, evidently from strafing on the way to Dachau. Most of the GIs just stood there in silence and disbelief. We had seen men in battle blown apart, burned to death, and die many different ways. But we were never prepared for this. Several of the dead lay there with their eyes open, a picture I will never get out of my mind. It seems they were looking at us and saying, what took you so long? There's another uh, veteran of the Thunderbird Division who wrote this. On top of one pile lay a young girl with her eyes wide open as if looking up at God and asking why. He's saying this about one of his colleagues. The GI who came across a little girl would see her face in his mind every night for the next 60 years until he was mercifully, mercifully able to fall asleep. Even as an old man, he was unable to answer her innocent question. Inside the camp, our soldiers, remember these boys fresh out of high school, 
when I was about 19 years old now, 18, they'd never seen anything like this. This is Barracks 10. They, they, these, these boys had been raised in wonderful families that taught them values and respect. And suddenly, after everything else they've seen in this war, they come to this place and they see this. They never, they could never believe that a group of people could do this to others. Even after the camp was liberated, inmates were dying by the hour, hour after hour, from typhoid and from starvation. This is a barracks that was set up by the U.S. Uh, military and by the Red Cross in Dachau just for victims of typhus. Our soldiers didn't realize it at first. They started feeding these very hungry, starved people as soon as they saw them. That's the worst thing they could have done at that point because their systems couldn't take it. They stuffed themselves and, and many of them died. So these deaths will go on for some time. Now, part of the confusion occurs here. I've read an account where all of the inmates were ordered to stay in their, in their barracks, and the Nazis began to burn the barracks when the Americans arrived. Um, I know that from reading, I know that the inmates gradually start coming out of their barracks, and the Nazis in these guard towers open up on them with machine guns. Somewhere along the way, the Americans fired back, got these guards out of the towers, and shot them. Some SS guards were indeed shot by our own American troops, as you can see here. They, they, they were so enraged by what they saw, they needed out justice themselves on the spot. Other guards were simply turned over to the inmates, and the inmates dealt with them. More than 67,000 inmates were found in the, the main camp of Dachau that day. 43,350 of them were political prisoners. 22,100 were Jewish. The rest of them came from various other groups. And yet records show, even though there were 67,000 people there that day, 200,000 it passed through the gates of Dachau. When army officers fanned out through the town of Dachau for eyewitnesses and for uh, in an effort to discover, you know, how this could happen, what happened, people began to see, oh, say, oh, I, I didn't know what was going on in there. I didn't know what was going on. In there. And so Eisenhower ordered the locals, their Dachau, to see for themselves what was going on in there. And this happens in many of the death camps that were liberated in Germany and other places. Um, our army officers ordered the locals to, to take a look. They also are ordered um, to help bury the dead. And then began the tremendous effort it was a logistical light, a nightmare, really, in trying to get the survivors, not only of DACA, but the many other camps that were discovered and liberated, back to their homelands. Many of them, when they returned to their homelands, didn't have a home anymore. It was gone, or somebody else owned it. Many of them, when they returned to their homelands, discovered that they were the only survivor in their family. So what happened to some of these people that I've mentioned? And by the way, DACO itself, ironically, is going to become a detention camp for Nazi prisoners for uh, more than a year. Uh, the uh, war crime trials of many of the doctors who were picked up are going to occur right here at DACO. We know that in April of 1945, Mr. Hitler 
uh, committed suicide in his underground bunker in Berlin as the Red Army was closing in. Heinrich Himmler, on the right, committed suicide at an interrogation camp in May of 1945. This is his daughter, the Nazi princess. She's 81 years old today. This is Gudrun Berwitz. She lives in a Munich suburb, very private life, very um, uh, secret life, practically. We know that she is still busy raising funds for Nazi causes, funds that are used for um, uh, those who are released from prison after many years, Nazi convicts are released from prison after fulfilling their terms, uh, funds that are used for those who are finally caught or tracked down and accused of war crimes. These funds are used for their defense, uh, at their trials or to fight extradition. She um, believes that her father was always right in his efforts. Um, she defends Nazism to this day. She, she has nothing she uh, claims that she's sorry about. How's that? Quite a lady, isn't she? Hilmar Broccoli on the left. One of the commandants of Dachau was killed on the Eastern Front. Theodor Eicha on the right, also killed on the Eastern Front. Egon Zill, captured while hiding after World War II. He's put on trial in uh, Munich and sentenced to life in prison. In 1955, however, he was successful in having his sentence reduced to 15 years. When he finally got out of prison, he moved to Dachau and lived there in that little town until he passed away in 1974. And then <clears throat> there's Shoni Alex Braun. He survived the Holocaust. He went on to marry a Holocaust survivor named Sherry. In 1950, Braun graduated from the Mozartian Academy of Music in Austria and then emigrated <clears throat> to the United States. Here in America, he earned his master's degree in music at Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. One of his great triumphs occurs in 1995. Braun performed the Symphony of the Holocaust with the Los Angeles Jewish Symphony at the Tribute to the Liberation uh, concert that year. The date, ironically, was April 30th, exactly 50 years after he had been liberated by American soldiers from Dachau. Dr. Ernst Holzner committed suicide in June of 1945. Dr. Eric Finca, died in an SS hospital on Fort the Naval in 1945. Roscher, on the left, ironically was sentenced to uh, Buchenwald by Himmler during the war because he was caught illegally adopting two children out of Dachau. And then finally, Klaus Schilling on the right, was one of the doctors who was executed by the Allies at Dachau in 1946. In closing, there's um, a passage I want to read concerning Roll Wallenberg. And by the way, these photographs are of the pathway that you may walk uh, in the northwestern corner of Dachau uh, in, in the wooded area where so many people were shot, where the ashes were buried, where there was a mass grave and so forth. A very <coughs> solemn place. Um, there were many people here when I visited and it was like walking in a, uh, through a church 
and a, and a very religious um, afternoon. Uh, it's that solemn. It's that sad. And you just can't help but to wonder why. You know, why could these people be rescued or saved before all this happened? Raul Wallenberg, a Swedish diplomat in Hungary, country in Hungary, was on a rescue mission. He knew that there were still 200,000 Jews alive there in that country who the Nazis hadn't gotten to yet. And so he did everything he could to save them. With financial help, much of it coming from the United States, Wallenberg strove mightily to outwit the Nazis. He bought buildings and flew the Swedish flag over them. He's from Sweden. Thus the buildings became Swedish territory, neutral ground. The Nazis couldn't go in there. Persons living in such houses were under the protect protection of Sweden. Wallenberg also created a special Swedish prote uh, protective passport. The Jews who received these passports were able to leave Hungary and escape the Nazi roundups. Wallenberg did everything humanly possible, frustrating the Nazis wherever he could. Despite his tireless efforts, he was able to save only half of the Jews of Hungary. The, the, the Gestapo had tried several times to assassinate him without success, but Wallenberg met a mysterious end. He disappeared. After Russian forces liberated Hungary from the Germans, he was seen going into Soviet headquarters in Budapest and was never seen or heard from again. He vanished. The Jews tell a story. God is not pleased with the way people have turned out. They are selfish, greedy, and mean-spirited. But in Jewish folklore, in each generation, there are 36 good and noble souls. These people are considered saints in other religions. For their sake and because of their goodness, God allows the world to continue to exist. Jews call these good souls Lamed Vavniks. You saw those three words on the very first slide before I started this presentation. The nickname is made of two Hebrew letters that stand for the numbers 30 and 6. Jews believe that in time of trouble, the Lamed Vavnik appears almost from out of nowhere to help them. The person may be anyone. You'll never know who he is or who she is. Could be a beggar, could be someone who's well born. The Jews are the oldest continuous civilization in the Western world. The ancient Greeks and the Romans have disappeared, but the Jews are still here. They have been persecuted for some 2,000 years. In times of need, they have fought back or moved out of harm's way. They believe they have been saved by a few things. The love of God, by celebrating their holidays and maintaining their traditions and by the Lama Vavniks who have come to their rescue in times of trouble. For Jews, many Jews all over the world, Roman <coughs> Wallenberg was a Lama Vavnik. I left some things out. There wasn't a whole lot of time, you know, for what I could have done. Some of you know, I have students who, who can attest to the fact that sometimes they have to stop me because the end of class has come along and I'm still going. But, um, <laughs> yes, sir. Do they know how many concentration camps there were total? Yes, there were many dozens um, concentration camps, work camps. There were about a dozen main, what we call death camps, like Auschwitz, and places like that. Most, most of those, the biggest ones were in Poland. 
Or at least for Europe. Yeah. yeah. The, um, some of the photographs that the, of the men, a lot of them the look like they're very, very young. Or they just, just, they're just so malnourished. They all kind of look like that, or were they all? No, some of them were, were young. Were young um, yes. And um, the older ones, when they came to DACA, didn't last very long at all. And that was intentional. The younger ones, they wanted them for work. And, and other places like Auschwitz, they separated them right away and they, they did away very quickly with those they didn't want. Yes? I have the wash house. Is that correct? Is that, is that supposed to be like one of these kind of gas chambers? Um, and you know, some of those barracks they did have a place where you could wash up, but um, in going to the gas chamber, they were told they were going to take showers. Yes, and um, especially for Jews, they're very clean people, it's part of their, their laws and so forth. Um, that was important to them, it would be important to any of us if we arrived there on a train after several days of being packed in the town. So a shower would be well compared to some showers and some showers. I was wondering about the most. Has anybody ever tried to go out and have a third place without the kind of Not that I know of. No. Yeah. Is there any form of like attempted retribution against Ica? I mean, I find it hard to imagine that somebody who did the things he did would just be let go out of prison. Oh, well, I think he wasn't just not Ica. He wasn't let go. Um, he went on to command the SS Totenkopf Division on the Eastern Front. And um, one day he went up on a small plane, a spotter plane, to see where the what the situation was out there on the battlefield. He got shot down. Oh, okay. I, yes. No, I, there wasn't. And I don't know why. <laughs> I, I would think the guy would have gone into hiding somewhere, but no, you, you couldn't see him walking the streets. There was no effort to do something to him. I think um, people felt that he had, you know, served his time, paid his dues. Now, there are other people like Eichmann, who escaped to South America. Eichmann is an individual I didn't mention. He was a war criminal, mass murderer, um, one of those who helped devise the final solution and took part in it. He escaped, and the Mossad got a hold of him later, the uh, equivalent of the Israeli uh, secret police. And they, they brought him to justice in the early 1960s. They kidnapped him from South America, brought him back to Israel, put him on trial, and they executed him. But there was such an outcry nationally over the fact that he had been kidnapped and railroaded, as some people said, uh, denied uh, adequate due process. That, the Israelis didn't do that again. But we do find people from time to time. Jim Yonyak up in Cleveland, about 10 years ago or more, probably 15 years now, uh, was accused of being a, a concentration camp guard. You'll see, you'll see that. But these people are so old today, so far, and few between. Concerning what the some some a handful of doctors did uh, to others and some children, but most of the time. Any other questions? A lot of the foundation of the barracks. Is there any actual barracks still standing here? Two. There's two still standing. Yeah, you saw you saw some of their photographs. I took pictures. Some of those are my pictures that, that I had in here. Okay. And um, the other, there are two still standing so they, you can see what, what it was like. 
The um, German government today has really put forth a strong effort to um, show the world what the Nazis did, what the result was. They, you know, they don't hide it. They want people to see it. They want the world to know that the Nazis hijacked their government and that um, this can't happen again. There's a lesson to be learned from this. So those barracks are there and we can see exactly what was going on. The what? The housing they had for soldiers and whatnot. Are those, those are office buildings, buildings and things like that, that today, I understand. We, we didn't go over there. They didn't take us over there on my trip. We didn't have the time for that. But uh, I asked about that. They saw those are office buildings and things, things of that sort. But there are other places where you know, homes still exist and there are people living. Yes. I wanted to say I went to Dachau in the 90s and it was in the middle of the winter, it was in December. My brother used to work in Germany uh, for the government, that's how I got there, I got to visit. And there's really not a whole lot to see because they burned it all down, you can tell me. There, there are a couple places you can look. But what I found is that um, the German people are very ashamed of it, they don't want you to go there. I mean, I went on a, like a military bus, like on a little tour, because my brother worked for the government, but he wasn't military. And uh, they, the, the, the guy that was the leader didn't want to, you don't want to go there. And we said, yeah, that's why we came on this tour, you know. So they took us to death hall, but they're very ashamed. And then the whole time he kept saying, well, we never used those ovens, the ones that Mr. Pappas was talking about, but the priests built those, but. They had a lot of priests that were prisoners in Dachau, Catholic priests, thousands and thousands. And, yes. uh, yeah, it's, you can, if you want to see something, like, I've heard that you can see more in Auschwitz. Like, they didn't have time to burn down Auschwitz completely. Um, but there's sometimes not a lot to see. The, the very worst, some of the worst camps, there's nothing there, like Sobibor and, uh, Theresa and stuff, there's nothing there because they just destroyed it completely. Oh, it was in, it's further up. Uh, yeah, it's in Berlin. In the capital. It wasn't around back. My husband, my name is Sa. Families from well, Solberg. He's from Germany. His grandfather lived there during his time, and he was almost beaten to death because he would not join the Nazi party. Mm -hmm. And as a result, like after the war was over, he sent my husband's um, dad and his sister here because he did not want them to live there. They live on a farm, and they would see, you know, a lot of you know, planes and things that, you know, flying over, they didn't really, they weren't really like in or whatever, they lived in a slave or something in a farm area. But anyways, he was, um, you know, and my, my husband didn't find that out until just recently, where his dad died and his dad was telling him the stuff that it happened, that yeah, his um, dad was always beat to death because he did not become it's common practice, and, and I've, I've emphasized this in every class I've taught any of this with World War II, General World War uh, I, and so forth. Again, the vast majority of Germans refused to join the Nazi Party. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons that they, so many of them were elected to the Reichstag earlier was because people were getting fed up with their government and was unable to take care of you know, their needs, and they didn't go vote. But the Nazis got their votes out. And so you see what happens when people don't participate in the process. Um, so all you need is for a group of thugs, a small number of them, uh, to, to gather together and organize and make an example of one person, like your, your relative from the past, your husband's relative. And uh, that set uh, the tone. Nobody else in the area wants to get involved because they don't want that to happen to them. Imagine if one of us was taken out for a couple of days uh, down the hall, and uh, maybe me, and I, I come back 
several days later, unable to talk, or all beat up, or busted up. Any of you want to take my place after that? Who wants to speak up? Of course not. There's a great book called Hitler's Jewish, I'm uh, sorry, not Hitler's Jewish enemies, Hitler's German enemies. And these people who opposed him weren't just Jewish people, they were Lutherans, Catholics, and um, it's, it's incredible what occurred to them because they spoke up or they wrote a letter. Just out of curiosity, what was the population of Germany, let's say, at the outset of uh, World War II? 60 million. 60 million? But how many people were in their armed forces? In their armed forces? They had about six or seven million. Never enough. And we talked about this in class a couple of times in recent weeks. Never enough to do what they had intended to do, what the party officials intended to do. They never even had enough resources um, to take on that task. But they thought they were supermen. They thought one at a time, countries being taken one at a time, using that new system of warfare, Blitzkrieg, and so forth. It would work. They didn't have a chance. Had they waited a few years, they would have perfected the atomic bomb, might have had the jet, might have had the rocket ready. Things could have been far different. They were pretty well along the way to perfecting the uh, fuels that were non gas based and also rubber as well. Mm -hmm. Synthetic rubber, yeah. Synthetic oil. Yes. I read an article, I wish I still had it. It's just kind of interesting. Everything evil, you know, kind of goes back to Hitler. You know, the, the 9 11 airplane that flew into. Well, Hitler was experimenting with how far um, his pilots could fly over to, to the United States and then just, you know, bought. so he had thought of that, but they didn't have fuel that could go that far at that time. It's really interesting to read some of this stuff. Any other questions? Thank well, you before you go, to, uh, we have to uh, oh. see who won the prize. Don't forget the raffle. <laughs> okay, let's see. How about that? Uh, we'll have you at the top. I know. <laughs> I also have a book. Thank you. Thank you.